give us a drive to 13 Mitigator Ford Fusion. I'd like to thank you for listening to Let's Talk Racing.tv. Let's Talk Racing. I'm Teddy Peter, driver of the number 17 Toyota in the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series, and you're listening to Let's Talk Racing. <laughs>
Right. But they theoretically, amazing. they can still win the championship without a win. Absolutely. Oh, it, it, it's all about consistency now. They're going to be going for that consistency. Right. They, they want those top fives every single week. Which is a little bit like the, the original point system was set up for years and years. Years is about winning, but it was about consistency. About yeah. consistency. Um, and now they've kind of gotten back to that, which I think is really interesting. It's going to be pretty cool. Yeah. Don't and you're to going win. to, let's see. You don't have to win to win. Does that sound right? <laughs> it's true. Chicago land. Like politics to me. Dover, Martinsville, right. Charlotte. But between right. Chicago and Dover, there's another one. Because Dover's like the third race after. Chicago. New Hampshire. New Hampshire. Dover, Dover Martinsville. There's a Charlotte race in there, isn't Charlotte's, there? Charlotte's before Martinsville. Charlotte's before, but right. is, and, and isn't there a Talladega. Um, a Talladega race in there? Right. So it's going to be interesting. I throw a road course in. Oh, I, Boy, think screw them all I think they should do it. I think they should throw a dirt track race in. I, you know, I've said that for years. That's um, right. Arca does it. Take them to Eldora on them race. Eldora. <laughs> you don't need to love that. Right. Well, you couldn't get enough seats in there. It, it, you'd have to make it like a br like a, a Bristol, Bristol. you right. know, to do that. But yeah, Springfield would be good. Duquesne would Duquesne be good. Um, how many, many samples did they hold up here in Saluda? <clears throat> Not enough. Maybe five thousand. Even the Indy Mile. Would be cool to do. Terre Haute, yeah. Yeah. That would that would be a cool place to have them too. Yeah. So, so. give him a dirt track. We're gonna ask Ned about that because he was the one that won the championship. He had to run dirt yeah, too. Absolutely. Back, back in the day. So. Ned's got great stories. Got great. Amazing stories. And, and we're gonna we're gonna hopefully get a few out of them. Oh, I'm uh, sure. We're at a quarter past. We have not seen Sean yet. Are, are we making a call? Yeah, I'm calling up Ned. All right, well, give him a call. Um, you know, i got to say something, too. Um, and actually, um, I said something to Doc the other night during the, um, the at the very end of the race when uh, Menard spun and could, stalled his car and couldn't restart, and then they had the yellow flag, and they regrouped. And I told Doc, I said, that looks a little suspicious to me. And now it's starting to kind of play out that, it's, that a lot of people are starting to kind of see. They've gone back and listened to the radio transmissions. And maybe, maybe not, there was a conspiracy involved with Menard deliberately dumping himself over there. And, and uh, there was some coded language. And uh, actually, Jimmy Spencer on Race Up retracted the footsteps on that. It was, it was really interesting. And uh, of course, Gordon's crew actually responded to that after the race. Said, "Did that seem a little fishy to you?" It's uh, so you never know. Yeah, you never know. It did make it interesting. Probably did. Absolutely. Are, are we good to go? Good to go. We got him on. We've got Ned Jarrett on the line. Welcome to the show, Ned. Thank you. Good evening. How are you doing tonight? Okay. First of all, I want to say congratulations, 2011 inductee, NASCAR Hall of Fame. Um, it's an honor to have you on here with us. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And that was quite an honor that was bestowed upon me back in May when they actually did the induction ceremonies. Of course, the election was done last October. So it's been uh, almost a year now that I've had to enjoy it. And it's been a fun ride. Have you have you found yourself getting a, a little bit more attention because of it? I, I mean, have you been going to some races and doing some other things for the Hall of Fame? I have been doing uh, going to some races and doing some things for the Hall of Fame that, uh, of course, had not done before. Uh, the uh, quest for autographs and other memorabilia is like every week. Absolutely. I appreciate the fans out there that have an interest in me and my career and the fact that I was inducted into the Hall of Fame. But it, uh, it has kept me busier. Well, one thing's for sure, Ned, you're, you're not only an icon uh, and well-deserving of being in the Hall of Fame, you're also a really cool guy. 
Oh, you're kind. We want to get to some really cool stories from back in the day because I've heard of many of these things. I've actually been around you a little bit through the years with Lake and Risa Speed, and um, I just find you to be one of the coolest characters I've ever run up against because you're such a gentleman, but you've got great stories, and especially in the very beginning. And I'm sure Matt's very interested in how some of this got going. Oh, yeah. Well, that's very kind of you to, to say those things. I always thought I was a pretty dull type of individual. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not flamboyant by any means, but uh, I, I don't know where the uh, Gentleman Ned uh, title came from. I don't know where it started. Uh, it was back certainly during my driving career, and uh, I've, I've been flattered by it over the years, but I don't, don't know where it came from or why, but uh, I do appreciate it. Ned, tell us a little bit um, um, this how you got involved in the race and it, it was a brother-in-law of yours that, that kind of got you into it and you kind of had to be a little sneaky about it well when they started building the hickory speedway back in the early 50s it was a big thing in the community there was not uh much entertainment available for fans uh they had a couple of movie theaters in town i grew up in the country of course on a farm and my dad had a sawmill and he took me to some races when when i was uh teenager and made a race fan out of me, but when they started building that speedway, it was a big thing. Go down to the country store on a rainy day, which farmers couldn't work out schools or a, a sawmill, sit around, or wait like I'll go up there and show them how to drive. Well, I'd hear those stories and I said, I, I want to try to do that. I'd always felt that I had a little bit of athletic ability that God gave me some talent in that respect, but I didn't get many opportunities to use it. I uh, played a little baseball and a little basketball in high school, but it was not good enough with either, either of them to excel to any degree. And of course, the programs that we had in the country schools back then, was not you were not going to get much attention anyway. And right. Anyway, uh, when they got that track finished and, and uh, at the first race, my brother-in-law was, uh, in fact, trying to get up a, a friendly poker game one day. And, uh, went down to one of those country stores, and he was there, and I said, how about coming and playing with us today? We need another player. And he said, well, I don't have any money. But he said, if I could f sell half interest in this race car I got, uh, he said, I, I'd go play. Uh, it, he was partners with the guy who had formerly driven it, a guy by the name of J.C. White. Mm. And he owed John Lentz my brother-in-law some money, and he said that White had told him that okay, if you can sell my interest in the race car, then I'll take the money for the debt. I, mm. Which is it? He said a hundred dollars, and I happened to have a hundred dollars, which was a lot of money back then. But anyway, I bought half interest in the car. And, uh, we took it to that first race, and, and uh, not, had, had no idea what we, I didn't have any idea what we were doing. They had. My brother-in-law had raced some. In fact, he'd been a former motorcycle racer as well. So anyway, we uh, did the best we could with him, finished 10th in the race, but I had done all of this without talking it over with my dad. And he came to me the next week on Saturday before the next race on Sunday and said, we need to talk. He pointed out how important I was. The, the sawmill business had grown after I had two brothers older than I who were both deceased now, but... But uh, they have, were out of school, and, and uh, of course I was out of high school at that time too, and uh, we were all working in the business, and he pointed out how important it was for, a, and he had graduated to a, a planing mill where we were buying lumber off of the other sawmillers and, and finishing it and hauling it into West Virginia and Ohio and places like that. And so he pointed out how important I was to the business, and he just didn't that it was too cool for me to be racing, driving cars, because the participants back then were either bootleggers, mm. considered to be bootleggers, or a bunch of fools that didn't have any better sense to get out there and risk their neck. Well, of course, I was not a bootlegger. I'm happy to say that I grew up in a Christian family. Not that bootleggers might not be Christians. I'm not like that at all. But uh, my dad always tried to raise us right, tried to teach us right from wrong, and try to build respect with our fellow man, and he could not see where my participating. Right. These people uh, could do too much to add to the image that he'd worked so hard to build, and uh, 
expect that he expected us to build with our fellow men. So after his speech, I, I understood where he was coming from. I'm not thinking that he was coming from here anyway. It was just something he wanted to do to have some weekend fun. And uh, So anyway, my brother-in-law decided, we decided that he'd drive it because he'd been a former motorcycle racer. And he did uh, pretty good, but uh, never come close to winning. And uh, one, they'd switched to night races then and in the summer, and one night he didn't feel like driving. And uh, we didn't look too hard for another driver. We went out in the infield and changed shirts and uh, put on the helmet. And we both had big noses, so people couldn't tell any difference there. So, mm -hmm. so her facial uh, features were similar. And anyway, uh, I, I drove the car and under his name. And nobody thought anything about it. Nobody said anything about it. No, I don't think anybody knew. <laughs> I finished second, and he hadn't done that well before. And we thought, well, I must be the best driver, so we got by with it that night. We'd just keep on doing that. And we did it, four, five, six races. I don't remember how many, but anyway, we, we kept running up in the top five every week, and then we lucked up and won a race. And uh, luck, anyway, we won it, whatever, however we did it. And uh, in a relatively small community, uh, the word got back to my dad, and so he came to me and said, okay. You're so determined to drive one of those things that use your own name to get credit for any accomplishments that you may have along the way. So, uh, he, he presented me probably with the biggest challenge that I was ever presented with. I've been presented with a lot of challenges. But uh, he said you couldn't feel respect for your fellow man uh, by participating with those people. I worked harder than I would have ever dreamed of working at anything to prove to him that it doesn't matter who you associate with that you can mm -hmm. respect. And so he made a better person of me. I don't know if that was his intent or if it just happened to work out that way, but I've, I've always appreciated it, uh, the lesson that he, the challenge that he put forth, the lesson that I learned from all of that. So he became the biggest fan of time went by. He, he ended up becoming a fan, and he really supported you after that mm -hmm. too, didn't he? Well, any way that he could. Uh, certainly, he, he, my father was never a wealthy individual. Uh, he he worked hard at multiple jobs, and, and just like the sawmill and moving in, buying the planing mill on credit, and giving something for his sons to do. In fact, the name of the company was H.K. Jarrett and Son, of the company. And, uh, he he wanted to try to build something for us, and he was always trying to help anybody, somebody in the funeral community or whatever, and uh, so he certainly, uh, uh, he never, in my recollection, never invested anything in the race car, mm. but he did uh, certainly spend a, a lot of uh, business experience and good common sense to, to the effort, and and, uh, and then, of course, uh, threw his blessings behind me, and that, that meant a lot. Mm. <clears throat> Now, throughout your career, there's one thing that really comes to mind, and a lot of people don't realize this, but you sold your first, or well, you sold Wendell Scott his first Grand National car. Is that correct? Well, I'm not sure that it was his first. It, it's the car that he won his race in, mm -hmm. 1961 Chevrolet. After we had won the championship in 1961, we were updating. We had two cars. And uh, all of two cars, <laughs> you know, they got 50 or 20 or so for each driver. But anyway, uh, we were updating to 1962 models because we were getting a little help from Chevrolet under the table, and they wanted to have us race current year model cars because that's what they were selling. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, uh, I sold Wendell one of those 61 Chevrolets and went on to win a race in that car. Now, did you get a lot of grief because of that, or, or you know, this? I, I know things were different back then. Was was there a? No, no, not really. No, it, it, I, I don't know how it happened that that Wendell uh, became a friend, and uh, of course, growing up in the South, it was tough right. for his race to to be in the public's eye and and try to do things like 
white people were doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't think that was fair. No. Uh, I never got on the stump or anything like that, preached about it. I, I just, uh, uh, I guess, befriended him in various ways, and would help him with tires, parts, uh, mm -hmm. as I could. Of course, I was struggling still myself. Right. To put away into the sport. But having some factory support, I was getting more than he was getting and more than a lot of other people were getting. And so I, I thought it, it wouldn't be wrong to share some of that uh, stuff with him. And we were not going to, to use, there were certain parts on the car that you just automatically pull off after each race. Mm -hmm. Right. Especially if you were <coughs> had factory support, you could get those two parts to bolt on. And so we would give uh, him some of those used parts, tires, and I sold him the car at a bargain. And those, in fact, I sold it to him on credit. Right. Now, it just, you know, I, I was see, I saw how he was struggling. If I could help, uh, it wasn't hurting me. Exactly. To help, accepting they were building a, another competitor out there, but that uh, uh, that was okay. And he was a very tough competitor too, wasn't he? He was. Yes, he was. I I always felt. In fact, I made the statement. I was in uh, after I got to, uh, cooked up with Ford in 1963. I went to uh, Detroit and or Dearborn, Michigan, where Ford's headquarters are, mm -hmm. and had lunch with Lee I. Coca, who was president of the Ford division, the Ford Motor Company at that time. And uh, he asked if there were any bike drivers in the race, mm -hmm. about, in the sport. And I, I told him about uh, Wendell, and I said, somebody is missing the boat. If I believe that the man has enough talent, uh, that if he had good equipment, that he could run up front. And I said, I believe that he would influence more people in his race to buy a Ford car or a Chevrolet or whatever it was than I or any of the other drivers that had factory support. And uh, I, I didn't know that anything would come of that. I was just making a statement of what I believed. Well, the very next day, mm -hmm. Lee Iacocca called John Holman of Holman & Moody, who, who was Ford Motor Company's marketing arm, I, I'm sorry, performance arm, mm -hmm. and, uh, and said, we need to get Wendell Scott a race car. So they called Wendell that afternoon and uh, said, come down, we want to give you a race car. And they did. They gave him a race car. Unfortunately, they didn't give him their best race car. <laughs> uh, but, but it was better than what he had. Right. Right. Uh, but uh, I always felt that if he would have had good equipment and a good team behind him, that he had the talent that he could have run up front. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Is there anybody in, in your racing career, and it, it's such a vast career, is there anybody else that really sticks out in your mind as someone who's like, I really enjoyed running with this guy? Well, I, I raced a lot with Richard Daly Eddie, in his early days. Mm -hmm. In fact, he started about six months in the Grand National Series before I did. I had been racing for about six and a half years in sportsman competition. Richard never raced in that type of competition. He went directly into Grand National, what is now the Sprint Cup Series. And of course, that's what his dad was doing, so he had uh, access to cars, and so he was able to do that. But I always enjoyed racing with Richard Petty because he was a fair individual. Uh, he, he certainly didn't need anything that I had, although they, you know, they struggled too. All of us did back in those days. They, right. There was not much money in the sport, but the Petty family uh, made a living from it. They were the first family mm -hmm. that made a living, made a business of it, and made a living from it. And uh, so they didn't have a lot that they could give away, but uh, uh, but he was one of the most fair people that that I ever dealt with, whether it was driving race cars or whatever I was doing. I mean, the man was, was always fair. I always appreciated that. Do you, now, now you, we've got two Grand National Championships, 1965. You are actually the only driver to retire as a champion. Is that correct? That is correct. Hey, what brought that along? I was still the reigning champion when, when I 
uh, quit. Now, uh, granted, there were only a few races left in 1966. Mm-hmm. He run that year, and and a new champion would be born, uh, uh, David Pearson. But, uh, but I was still the reigning champion when I drove my last race. Right. And, and I, I've always said that however far up the ladder I got, I would quit. Mm-hmm. While I was at that point in my career, I would not go down the other side because people have a tendency to remember you for the last thing you did. Absolutely. Them to remember me as a has been. Of course, Richard Petty has has long proven that uh, that he, he still, you know, his career went. He was not as competitive in the last ten or twelve years of his career as he was up until then. Sure. But still, his popularity and respect has been there uh, but he had a long long career to build all of that and, and I had a relatively short career and uh, I, I just wanted to I just wanted to go out and well, now, I'm sorry go ahead. Well, also too Ned knowing a little bit about your history um, you were very close friends or the way I understood it with Fireball Roberts and, and, and of course, that was a different era. It was, it was a lot more dangerous then than it is now. And uh, I've heard you say that some of these accidents right along that time with Fireball and a few other people also played into that decision of, of retiring. Is that is that true or is that just myth? Well, uh, certainly. Let me say this: Fireball was a, was a good had become a good friend of mine. Right. And uh, we had said the night before that accident, 1964, at the Charlotte Motor Speedway for, uh, with what is now the Coca-Cola 600. Mm-hmm. We'd sat outside the pool at the motel that we were both staying in and talked for a couple of hours. And uh, he told me of his plans to, to quit driving. He had an opportunity to represent a major company. Mm. And he was going to pay uh, good money. And so he, he decided uh, he was going to run some more races that year, and that would be it. And uh, mm. anyway, he didn't share that with everybody. Right. And uh, I'm, I'm just saying that to solidify the fact that we had become friends and, and respected each other. And uh, so when you lose a friend like that and someone who you respect, it certainly preys on your mind, knowing that you don't have the safety. And I'll take just a moment, if you don't mind, and, and for those fans that might not know what happened in that accident. Now, some people hesitate to ask me about it because they think that I might uh, not want to talk about it, but, but uh, I don't have any problem with that. Right. It was in the early stages of the Coca-Cola 600, and uh, Junior Johnson and I were battling for like fifth and sixth position, and... Uh, Junior got on the inside of me going into turn one, and there was a bump and right in the middle of between turn one and two. Mm-hmm. You had to have your car positioned just right, or, or the thing would get sideways with you, or uh, maybe even jump into the wall. Uh, mm-hmm. It was just, that's just the way the track was. And uh, so anyway, Junior hit that bump, and, and the front end of his car bounced over into me, and, and we both spun. I spun to the inside of the track, Junior spun to the outside of the track, and uh, my car hit the inside retaining wall backwards, and when it did, it burst open the gas tank. We were running conventional metal gas tank. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, when I slid down the wall then with that gas, raw gasoline running out there, it created sparks and started on fire. Fireball Roberts was behind us, and I don't know to this day if he slowed down uh, to avoid us and someone hit him from the back and spun him, or if he just lost control of his car and trying to maneuver around us. We had to track pretty well taken up, the two of us, one spinning the inside, one to the outside. Mm-hmm. And uh, anyway, uh, he also spun, spun to the inside, hit the inside retaining wall, hit me, his gas tank burst open. And as we slid down the wall almost about two-thirds of the way, down the straightaway, on the back stretch of Charlotte Motor Speedway, and uh, there was an opening in the wall where they allowed traffic to go across. In fact, the uh, trucks that hauled the race cars back then or any big vehicle couldn't go through the tunnel. Mm. They had to go across mm. the racetrack and they had an opening in the inside retaining wall to allow them to do that. They didn't put a guardrail or a gate or anything. They just left that opening there. And uh, that was part of the learning process as far as safety is concerned. 
concerned. But, but anyway, he hit the embutment of, the, of that opening in the wall, and when he did, it burst the firewall open in his car, flipped his car upside down on his roof, and our cars come to rest about 30 feet apart. I jumped out of my car, started to run over to the, and sit down on the wall, but I saw him starting trying to come out of his car, and so I ran over there and, and uh, helped him to get out of the car. And, uh, I mean, there was flames were everywhere. Both cars were burning. Mm. Mine didn't catch fire on the inside until maybe a minute or so after I got out of it. And uh, anyway, he and I stood there together and tried to rip his uniform off. He was a cleft. The first people that I saw with a with a uh, uh, tailor-made uniform. Right. Right. Or it, it has zippers on the legs, <clears throat> on the sleeves, and up the sides. I mean, it looked good. Uh, but try to get that thing off in a hurry. That's a job. And right. Anyway, it, it, everywhere there was an opening around the neck and around the bottom of the legs and the sleeves. That's where the the fire was, and we were ripping it, trying to tear it off until the uh, safety people got there. Uh, uh-huh. Both got burns in trying to do that. But uh, I, I say all of this to to let the fans know what what went on there and what happened. He was not physically injured in that race car. Right. He was uh, not injured at all. But uh, when I got to him, he was trying to get out with the car upside down, trying to crawl out, and I reached in and pulled him out. And uh, that's when we started tearing the uniform. He said, oh, my God, Ned, I'm on fire. He said, oh, my God, Ned. And so, anyway, we, we did the best we could. To get that right. Off. And <coughs> what came, two things came out of that, <coughs> major, major things. Uh, one was Firestone went to work immediately after that and started building a fuel cell. And uh, right. that that's where the fuel cell started. And then DuPont went to work immediately after that and started developing a pump that would be flame-proof. Right. Right. It would have a flame-proof uniform. If, if we'd had either of those that day, I don't think Fireball Roberts would have lost his life. Sure. See, he lived for about six weeks and eventually died of blood poisoning. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize he he really didn't mm-hmm. die. He died from the accident, but it was blood poisoning that actually exactly. took his life. Yeah, right. and and you know the, the the medical industry didn't have the the technology then that they have today. If they would have had that the technology they have today, they could have saved him then. Yeah, that mm-hmm. uh, they, they did the best they could with what they knew how to do and and what they had to work with, but. Uh, uh, it's too bad that someone has to lose their life. Uh, now, I will say this, too. That was back when the Indianapolis 500 was run on on uh, Labor Day, regardless of what day of the week it was. You know, I mean, I'm sorry, right. Memorial Day. And uh, uh, now they've, they've made laws where Memorial Day is on a Monday every year, last Monday in May, I guess. Right. But back then, it was whatever day of the week it fell on. That And that year, it fell on Monday. Mm-hmm. The race at Indianapolis, there was a very fiery wreck also. Right, uh, right. And the Eddie Sack. Uh, yep. And uh, so so that combined with the wreck we had in Charlotte uh, you know, made people really start working and say, we we got to make things safer. Right. It was a wake-up call. Absolutely. Now, w- not sin, but you know, there again, it's too bad that, that these people lost their lives. Right. You guys had a lot of fun back then. I, I mean, even off the track, you guys were kind of like a, a traveling band of gypsies. Would you kind of say that's right? Yeah, it was. Uh, uh, it, it was not uh, nothing close to the way they do it. But there again, we were doing it the best way we knew how, and, and the best way we could afford it. Uh, but uh, it was fun. It, it was a challenge, and uh, that's what I was looking for when I got into the sport. Was a challenge. Absolutely. I never considered myself to be a speed demon or a thrill seeker. I just liked the challenge of doing something different that everybody else didn't do. And, uh, and of course, I love cars and, and fell in love with racing. Real quick. So that's what my big challenge became, that we have to work on cars. And, uh, that's one thing that we had to do, uh, and we got to do it, uh, because we couldn't afford to hire all the people. To right. To uh, work on the cars and build them and all that, so we had to help do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that was fun to to be able to go out to 
put some, help to put something together, and then go out there on a, a night race or a Sunday afternoon or whatever it was, and go out there and take that piece and try to beat somebody with it. I mean, that, you know, there was as much gratification from that as there was from, from driving the car and, and winning. So it, uh, it was a lot of fun. And you guys just didn't do it on asphalt. Your NASCAR wasn't just asphalt. You ran dirt, too, didn't you? The majority of the races that I raced on, in fact, the majority of the races that I won were dirt. That's amazing. The races that That's amazing. Oh, I haven't counted them up, and I haven't seen numbers where anybody else counted them up. Mm-hmm. But, but I would guess that that more than 30 of the 50 races that I won were run on dirt. I think we should get back to that. What do you think? Well, it would be fun. <laughs> we're trying to we're trying to get him to throw a nice dirt race into the chase. I'm sorry. Trying to get him to run a dirt race in the chase. I've read some things where some people would like to see that happen, but first of all, there's not a facility that right. that could accommodate. <clears throat> That's true. Uh, the Cup Series today with the grandstands, people in that they need to, and uh, it, it would be a very, very expensive thing to do, and I guess that's one thing that is... It, it would be fun, though, wouldn't it? It would be. We can dream about it. These guys like Tony Stewart, uh, his background, you know, was dirt racing. I noticed uh, Jimmy Johnson was quoted this past week, or a week, week before last, when he and Gordon were racing sideways at Atlanta, uh, and he said he was glad that he started in dirt cars because uh, that uh, helped him. Absolutely. H- helped him run, yeah. Mm-hmm. Running sideways there at 180 or 90 miles an hour. Well, and you see all these, you, you actually see them all going and running dirt on their off weekends. Oh, they do, yeah. yeah. So um, They enjoy it. I mean, that, that, that is really fun racing. There's no, no doubt about that. Absolutely. Uh, do you get a chance to go see some local? I know you were the promoter at Hickory Motor Speedway for a while, but do you get a chance to go see some grassroots racing? Not much. Uh, they, they have a standing invitation that I can go up there any time. I, I just I don't go. Maybe I should. I, I go up there a couple or three times a year uh, for if they want me to be mm-hmm. special. I know we had a deal for the Hall of Fame up there earlier. You actually won a race here at our home track, Langley Speedway, correct? I did. I enjoyed that track. It, that is the closest track to the Hickory Speedway of any track that I ever raced on. Really? Yeah. You had the design and uh, everything about it. About the same length. And mm-hmm. everything about it was very similar to the Hickory Speedway. And so that was another reason that I enjoyed racing there. But, uh, did you run on it when it was asphalt or when it was dirt? When it was dirt. When it was dirt? Yes. Okay. Um, and i got to ask you about this because it's one of my favorite stories, and i got a similar story to that. But you got to s- tell us about the night coming back from Chinese Corner. <laughs> uh, that was when we were racing uh, sportsman cars. Right. Running 37 Ford Coupes. And we we would go there. They would, then, with no interstates, it was, almost 350 miles from here. So I'd get off from work to Sawmill at noon, and we would hightail it there and get there about 7, 7.30 or something like that, just in time for practice. And uh, and then we'd race, and then we'd come back, drive back that night and get back home about 7 o'clock in the morning so that we could uh, go back to work. And uh, so we were, we towed it behind my crew chief, Brad Allman, had a relatively new 1955 Ford and so we were towing the car behind his Ford and uh, of course he was driving it and I would lay down and sleep because I had to go back to work the next morning mm. and so we, we found some country roads up there in fact all of them were country roads but even the main highways were country roads but we also would uh, found some shortcuts here and there and uh try to make a little better time. And uh, anyway, and I need to say this, that the way the tow bar that we used on it was to drill two holes in the, each of the front rails on the race car and put a long 
ride through it. Mm -hmm. Not an inch ride. Go through there, and then they bore a hole in that rod and put carter keys in it to hold it, keep it from slipping out. Right. And, uh, and then you had a, a, like a trailer hitch on the race car, and that's, that's how you towed it. And uh, so we were coming up through the country, and he was running about between 80 and 90 miles an hour with that thing. And uh, I was laying in the back seat, and all of a sudden I felt the, the car that we're riding in sort of jiggle, and, you know, just something about right. And I raised up. And looked over, here comes the race car up beside of us. <laughs> he backed off a little bit, he didn't jam the brakes on because he didn't want the race car to run into his new forward. And so anyway, of course these cars are set up, all race cars are set up to go left. And uh, so it just was veering left. And there was a sloped bank there. And uh, it just went right up that bank and it jumped a barbed wire fence. <laughs> and uh, that thing went down through a cow pasture there just high tailing it down through there. It had one little old tail out on it. We could see that thing look like a rabbit going down through there in daylight with his <laughs> white tail <laughs> and that little light. It got right within 10 feet of a stream. I don't know if it's a creek or a river or what it was, but anyway, it was a stream. And it, it finally just ran out of momentum and stopped. So we high tailed it down there and got to it, cranked it up, and it only had one axle in it. And that's the way we towed it. And uh, so, but it still would pull. So we drove it back up there and got back up there and, uh-oh, here's the fence. We didn't touch, that car didn't touch the fence when it went over it because it went up that slope bank and it just launched it right over that fence and down through the field it went. Well, we didn't have that bank coming back the other way. So I told Bud, my crew chief, I said, stand back. I'm just going to have to go through the fence. So I ran that race car right through that fence. <laughs> we, we hooked it back up and, and somebody had forgot to put that Carter key in. And, and that thing, we had, we were at least 150 miles from Chinese Corner, and uh, it finally worked its way loose. <laughs> came loose at that time. <laughs> houses, lights of houses, farmhouses started coming on, and we, said, we better get out of here. We, we're going to be in deep trouble. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great story. That's a great story. <laughs> Down there that had an all night service station there, and we. Uh, had to reset the tow in and do a lot of things like that so we could tow it on home. <laughs> have you have you ever had any um have you ever had anybody come up to me and say, you know, that was my field? <laughs> no, because I didn't tell the story for a long, long time. <laughs> oh, oh. oh, okay. That's it. That's it. Yeah. You went from the race seat. And pretty much, you just walked right into the broadcast booth. Tell us a little bit how you kind of got started on that. Well, the, the only way that I got started on it was when I won the championship in 1961, I honestly lucked up and won the championship that mm -hmm. I didn't expect to. That was my first year with Chevrolet, and uh, I, I, I just I ran all the races, or the majority of them, and uh, but I... Got more points than Rex Friday. He had less trouble than I did, or he had more trouble than I did, and uh, so I beat Rex for the championship. And he had recommended me to shove away to get in for them to back, give me some backing. Right. And, uh, and bless gosh, I, I won the championship off of him. He'd won the championship in 1960. And uh, so anyway, I, I was not prepared to represent a sport my family, or myself. I didn't know what to do with the championship. Even though I had won the sportsman championship in 57 and 58, uh, there, there was not a whole lot that you did representing right. anything. Uh, and, but you know, this was a bigger deal. And uh, they took me to New York and, and uh, in front of the media there. They didn't have the banquet there, then, but they took me up there for a, a couple of days just to try to get exposure for the sport. And uh, so I, I did have the presence of mind to buy a suit. I didn't have one, and uh, and wear it up there. But, but anyway, uh, I said I'm I'm going to win this championship again. I'm going to be better prepared the next time. And so I took a Dale Carnegie course. Right. Right. And that's the best thing that I ever did. I know mm -hmm. Wade Powell is a uh, big Dale Carnegie man down in your part of the country and a good friend of mine, and and has been a big supporter of the old Jerry family and. Uh, he, he knows that I love to talk about the Dale Carnegie course because it, it, it did so much for me. 
Absolutely. So it took us to 65. That was 61. I took the course in January, started pacing in January of 62. And, uh, and it took us to 65 to win the championship again, but it was much better prepared. And as a result of taking the, the uh, Dale Carnegie course, mm -hmm. the few media people who were covering the sport back then would seek me out for interviews because they had found somebody that could talk a little bit. Before then, I mean, I was a bashful country boy. And uh, before then, I'd then look down at the ground if somebody was talking to me. But after you go through that course, you know, you won't tell the world what you know. And uh, so they'd seek me out for interviews. And uh, that opened the door for me then to start uh, getting some broadcast assignments after I retired. In fact, in 66, while I was still driving some that year, Kenneth Campbell and uh, uh, Sammy Bland, who was doing the PA at Richmond and all the races in that mm -hmm. area were, in fact, Kenneth Campbell was a PR person at Richmond. And uh, so they had a little network that they were on the Northern Tour. They were broadcasting the Sunday races, uh, the two Sunday races. And so I fit in with them on those broadcasts at their request, and uh, that's what really got me started. Then uh, after I did quit, uh, Hank Schoolfield, who owned, owned uh, Universal Racing Network, which was the dominant radio network back then, uh, asked me to join them. Then when MRN came along in the mid-70s, I joined them, or really in the late 60s, and I joined them then uh, in the early to mid-70s. And then... Uh, when CBS came into the sport in 1979 and started doing some races live in the 1979 Daytona 500 that everybody remembers mm -hmm. uh, on that telecast and stayed with them until they uh, lost the broadcast rights of, of any races uh, after the year 2000. So I was with them for 22 years. Wow. That's amazing. And, and so you've called... You've called some great races over the years then. I was blessed. Although CBS didn't do a lot of races, they only did seven to nine races a year. Right. ESPN came along, and uh, they asked me to join their group. And at that time, CBS didn't have any problem with that because the number of races they were doing would not demand exclusivity, and ESPN was just an independent uh, cable company. Right. Out there, and uh, there was no threat to CBS at that time, so so they allowed me to work for ESPN. Right. As the world knows, later on ESPN was sold to ABC. <laughs> yeah. I was grandfathered in on the deal. <laughs> Anybody's knowledge, I'm still the only person that worked for uh, two different networks. Now I know uh, Larry McReynolds and some of those guys do Fox, but they're they're uh, and TNT, but all of those are are related. Right. On, Interconnected. Right. And, and uh, uh, but this after ABC bought ESPN, I mean, that was a direct rivalry uh, with CBS. Uh, yeah. Still allowed me to, to, I couldn't work the races on ABC. Right. But I could still do the ones on ESPN. On ESPN. I appreciate that. So I stayed with ESPN through when they lost broadcast rights also in 2000. And that's when NBC and Fox came mm. Of course, we know what your favorite race that you have ever commentated on and you, you can elaborate that on as much as you want. Well, that, of course, is the 1993 Daytona 500. I Absolutely. Have somebody to ask me about it today. I, there are not many, certainly no weeks that ever go by before someone, someone brings that up. And not many days that go by that someone doesn't bring that up. Uh, that has been mentioned more than all other races put together that I worked as far as uh, television and it was the 1993 Daytona 500. Mm -hmm. I was working in the booth with Ken Squire and the late Neil Bonnet. And uh, Dale Jarrett was driving for Joe Gibbs Racing. And, and uh, Dale Earnhardt was trying to win his first Daytona 500. Mm -hmm. been trying for how many years? I don't know. But anyway, he hadn't won yet, won yet to that point. He found it he'd win in 98. But anyway, uh, uh, DJ, uh, Jeff Gordon, that was his first Daytona 500. Uh -huh. yeah. Right. He was running very good. I mean, he drove a tremendous race for a rookie in that race. And he just sat there and rode on Earnhardt's bumper. Just, just, he had that plan. If he could get to it, he'd just ride and draft him and finish second. That was okay. He was going to be happy with that. Well, DJ had got up to third, and uh, he had a pretty fast race car. And uh, so he 
he followed them there for 15, 20 laps or something, and, and he saw where Jeff's car was getting a little bit loose and, and uh, where his weak spot was, and so he made a move on him with about, I don't know, three or four laps to go and, and, and passed him on the outside. I'm sure that, because they were riding the bottom all the time, mm-hmm. I'm sure that was a big shock to Jeff, and, and, and so he didn't know how to throw the block. He was, that was his first race, uh, first day on the 500. So anyway, uh, he got by Jeff, got up to second, then he started working on Earnhardt, and he saw Earnhardt's car was getting very loose. And uh, so he he had learned enough in his career to know where that he needed to, to really put the pressure on. That was going into turn three. And uh, so coming around to get the white flag, he drove up behind Earnhardt just as close as he could and got Earnhardt's car looser than it had been before, and he slid up the track, and DJ got under it. And it came around to cross the start finish line side by side. Well, the producer of CBS had told Neil Bonnet, and he has the ability to push a button and talk to each individual announcer, or he can push another button and talk to all of them at the same time. Unknowing to me, he had told Squire and Neil Bonnet that now if Neil Jerry takes the lead, said, You guys back off, we're going to let Ned call the last lap. See, I didn't know he told them that. <laughs> Went in the first turn, and, and Dale took the took the lead going into the first turn and uh, so it came on my head said, said okay Ned said call your son home and be a daddy <laughs> when I went from being supposedly a professional announcer to being a dad and, and uh, cheering for him on national TV absolutely it, it was great I watched it I'm, I'm sure the other guys here watched it also it, it was it was one of those things that put ghost bumps on my on all over me every time I think about mm-hmm. it well, I've had numerous grown men come up and tell me that they cried or had tears in their eyes and, and, and some still say when they watch it again they still have tears in their eyes that, that makes us feel good it, it certainly was a great moment in, in our lives and mm-hmm. apparently has become a, a great moment in the sport auto racing too and it, it just and that's one thing honestly that helped uh, get me elected to the Hall of Fame it wasn't the 50 races that I wanted to do championship that wasn't the whole thing uh, certainly they both of those things contributed, but I think my broadcasting career and that race that we're talking about here in particular uh, carried a lot of weight in uh, getting some votes for me to get into the whole thing. It, the, and I don't think a lot of people realize that it, 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 it was more of your broadcasting that brought you to the Hall of Fame, and and well deserved, I might add. I mean, well, thank you. I appreciate that. I was fortunate to to be at the right place at the right time and be able to get in on the ground floor. I was uh, was in in the early days of the actual racing part, but not on the absolute ground floor. floor. The NASCAR was uh, formed in 1948. And the Grand National Series started in in 49, and uh, I didn't start my career in anything until uh, 52. So so I didn't get in on the absolute ground floor of that, but I did get in on the ground floor of, of television. That's and, and Rita was the first radio, first driver to be hired to work on the radio broadcast. Yeah, and I was getting ready to say that. You were the first race car driver, really, literally, to jump right up into the booth. Yes, yes. I was, I was very, very fortunate to, to be, again, at the right place at the right time. Um, what do you think of these guys that, that are doing it now? I mean, you got Andy Petrie and... Um, uh, uh, Rusty Wallace and all these guys. Do you think they they bring what you all had to bring back then to make it more exciting? Well, they do in a different way. Uh, they're they're very talented people, and certainly the experience that they've had. Uh, Andy Petrie has surprised me. Uh, Andy, I saw him from the time he was a kid. Grew up. His dad was the uh, and mother were good friends of ours, and uh, was a high school mate of Dale. And, uh, and and I'm sure that you heard the story that, that uh, when uh, when Jerry Punch when the ESPN first came back in and Jerry Punch was the anchor person uh, on ESPN and the ABC broadcast and, and Dale and Andy working with him all three of those guys went to Newton Carver High School and graduated right yeah the Jerry has a couple years on, on those guys but uh, Andy and Dale were were they played football and other sports in high school together and were buddies in high school and then one day wind up on national television that was pretty cool but uh, anyway they, they, they Andy has uh, I never 
looked at him as being a broadcast type person. But I'll tell you, he is. I think he does a very, very good job. Not only because he's a friend, but he's he's just uh, he's very knowledgeable from the crew chief standpoint. I I think that he's the best that there has been that has come along. Of course, there again, I'm prejudiced, but uh, uh, and and they they have more tools to work with than we had back then. I think that in in the day when Denny Parsons and I were working together. Uh, that we, uh, our personalities, which were not even similar, uh, other than some people would say we're both nice guys, but uh, and I know Benny was, but but uh, anyway, uh, it took those kind of personalities and the knowledge we had of the sport to be able to paint the picture, even though they'd be seeing it on television to explain it. Uh, I, I think that we were right for that time. And I think the people who are doing it today are right for, for this time. I think that we could, if we would have had that technology or if we were in our prime in broadcasting there today, that we could do it uh, with guys that are doing it today. Just like the race drivers, I, I feel the same way about them. I, I feel that the race cars back in my day, race car drivers back in my day, could, could uh, be competitive with the race car drivers out there today and, and vice versa. I think those guys were even though they were the cars were harder to drive and you didn't have power steering and didn't have any cooling effects and didn't have uh, much brakes on them and, and the tires uh, were totally different and there was just so many differences in, in the cars but I, I think they would have adapted I think they had the talent they could have adapted that sure. at least uh, a good portion of them could have right. yeah. so, somebody on our uh, chat room asked us um to ask you about this, and, and, and I'm kind of going to do this in a, a roundabout way. How do you feel about this drivers have at it? I, I mean, back in the day, and I heard a pretty famous driver tell me one time that there was no such thing as a black flag, and, and it seems like NASCAR is kind of wanting to get back to that. How, what's your kind of take on that? Well, I, I applaud NASCAR for, for opening it up a little bit so that they can be themselves out there and and, uh, and race and, and not be so concerned about getting behind or getting surprised in one way or another. Uh, I, I think that that's one of the best things that happened to our sport in recent years is they, that they've let them go at it uh, more. Uh, we did it back then, but a lot more than they do now. Uh, but we didn't have a camera in every move that was made on the racetrack like they do now. So we could get by with a lot of things that they, that they can't today. But as we talked about earlier, most of them were one groove racetracks. And it was almost impossible to pass anyone unless you bumped them, bumped them out of the way. There was a bump and run type of situation. And that's, everybody knew it. That's the way that it was. And so just uh, that's the way you raced. So I'm, I'm glad that they, they let them go at it. It, it, that's you know I, that was one thing, and then somebody else brought that back up. They're, you know they're building you know half a million dollar cars now, and you know back in the days in the fifties and the sixties, y'all pretty much had tanks, but y'all also realized that you had to run it possibly the next night. Yeah, yeah that we we had to take care of the cars, no doubt about it, because uh, in the first year that I ran the full circuit. 1960, I started out with only one race car and intended to run that race car in every race. I ran it in the Daytona 500 and uh, went to Spartanburg, South Carolina the next week with the same car on a half-mile dirt track. And uh, and then about uh, before we got to the Coca-Cola 600 in May, uh, there was a Ford dealership, Courtesy Ford, in Charlotte that owned a couple of cars that Curtis Turner and Joe Weatherly were driving. Mm. And so they uh, they decided they were spending more money than they wanted to spend on race cars. And so they they stopped their operation and uh, called me up and and offered to lease me one of the cars. And so I leased a car a race car from Courtesy Ford to run on the super speedway. That's what their cars were basically built for because that's the races they were running. 
And so that freed my other car up a little bit that I didn't have to run it everywhere. I had to run it on short asphalt tracks and uh, and dirt tracks. But, uh, at least uh, I had a, a different car that I could run super speedways. And, and the terms of the lease was that uh, I would give them 25% of what I would keep the car up and give them 25% of what I won and return it to them at the end of the year in uh, good racing condition. Wow. And, uh, and We'd love to get a deal like that today, wouldn't we? Big bird. We'd love to have those kind of deals today. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, unfortunately, the last race that I ran uh, at Atlanta, I blew the engine, went out, went into the wall, and I had to fix that race. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't work out as well as you expected, huh? Oh, man. That was tough. Yep. We, we ran that year, I, I, don't, I think we ran about 45, 48 races or something like that, and uh, won five races during the year. Going into Atlanta, had, uh, I was in third place in the point standing, and uh, had a chance to move into second place, and then I blew that engine, so I dropped to fifth in the point standing. But uh, we won 29000 and some odd dollars. Mm. Wow. Spent just raw expenses, uh, thirty-one thousand and something. <laughs> and, and then, then I had to borrow money. I borrowed money, borrowed ten thousand dollars from a rich guy here who'd never seen a race till his death. Uh, but he just he liked me, and, uh, so he I met him in the hospital, and uh, he uh, said, "If I never help you, he said let, let me know." So I, I needed help, and so I went to him. And or ten thousand dollars, so that's what I lived off of. I lived off of about seven thousand dollars because it was about between two and three thousand dollars difference in what I won and what I actually spent, as far as the racing is concerned. Can you uh -huh. running forty seven, forty eight races and only spending thirty one thousand dollars? But we did it, and that included the tires, that included paying the mechanics, and uh, everything, and uh, travel, and, and everything. So we won twenty nine thousand or something, and so ten thousand dollars between the twenty nine and thirty one thousand is like twenty five hundred dollars difference. So anyway, the other money is what that I borrowed from him is what I lived on. It was what you lived on. You can you you can these drivers couldn't live on ten thousand dollars even for a weekend at, for a race these days. No, so they could. Uh, I guess there were a lot of bologna sandwiches involved with this little deal too. A lot of what, I'm sorry. Bologna sandwiches. Oh, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you take yours with mayonnaise or mustard, Ned? Uh, mustard. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, somebody in our chat room just brought up, and we had just talked about this boys have at it, but how do you feel about these feuds? I mean, we've got uh, Kevin Harvick and, and, and Kurt Busch seems like they're going at it every week. Or, or not Kurt Busch. Um, Kyle Busch. Kyle Busch, and then and then Kurt Busch and Jimmy Johnson going at it. How, what's your kind of take on them? Well, I think it's good for the sport, really. Yeah. You know, it, it gets the attention in a different way, and and it also brings out the true personalities of, of these people. It, it's interesting to, to see and hear how it, it's out, and and you know, people the say things in a moment of uh, heat that they wouldn't say. Uh, normally, otherwise, I'm sure that Kirk Bush would have handled things a little bit differently last Saturday night if he had had a little bit more time to think about it and cool off a little bit. But you know, at that time, he was saying and doing what he thought was was the thing to do. Absolutely right. You, you know what? And that kind of brings up a question: Did you ever have a driver? You do kind of like I'll call it a Kurt Bush. Did you ever have any problems interviewing any drivers? The other drivers? Yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, uh, I, I had a lot of run-ins with Junior Johnson. Oh, really? Oh, I bet. I bet. Probably my biggest rival on the racetrack. And, uh, I mean, we fought tooth and nail a lot of times. In fact, one night we were racing at Hickory, and both of us, were sort of our home track, although Wilkesboro would have been his absolute home track, but, but Junior drove in the first race that I drove in at the Hickory Speedway. It wasn't his first race, but but he was, it was the first race of ever run at Hickory Speedway, and uh, so we we had formed a rivalry in the uh, Sportsman Series, uh -huh. right? Before we ever got to Grand National, and so certainly when the Grand Nationals would go to 
victory. I mean, that was our territory. We 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 wanted to win, and we literally wore. I was driving a Chevrolet at that time, and and uh, Junior was driving a Pontiac, and we we wore two General Motors cars out because <laughs> we wound up wrecking each other. And uh, anyway, there was a guy by the name of B.G. Holloway from Florida. He was an heir of the Gray Steamship Line. And uh, so he was uh, the registered owner of my car, mm. although he didn't put a whole lot of money into it, but uh, but it, it helped. And he was good friends with Big Bill France. And uh, so he called France at home. France was, the, ne- the next day we were racing at Richmond, and when Richmond was still dirt. And, right. Uh, he called France and said, we got to do something. He said, we can't afford for these cars to be torn up like this. And there again, we only had two race cars. And uh, well, I did. That's all we had. And uh, so we had to take the other one to Richmond and uh, the one that we planned to run on the super speedway track. But anyway, France flew from Daytona to Richmond and called Junior and I both in, in their little truck. It wasn't a big fancy office like they have in the truck today that right. we called to. But uh, anyway, called us up there and had us, uh, gave us a real talking to. <laughs> it helped for a little while, not too long, until we got got at it again. I'll tell you a quick story. <coughs> when we were racing in the Sportsman Series at Hickory, and uh, Junior and I were battling for the lead one night, and uh, he hit me and knocked me into the bank, and uh, naturally I was mad about it, so we came back the next week, and we was battling again, and I caught him going into turn three, and, and didn't try too hard to dodge him, and, and uh, hit him, and he, he went up the bank, and there was no guardrail or bank, I mean, a, a wall or anything, it was at the dirt bank, and uh, so it put him out of the race, and after the race, we stand, they had a little pagoda down on the inside where the PA announcer stood, and, and they, it was, that's where they would pay off after the race, and the, there was a wooden fence there, and Junior and I, I'd, I'd go, saw him stand there, so I went over and talked to him, I said, Junior, I, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to, uh, to hit you there and knock you into the bank and uh, I said my brakes gave away and I, I had all kind of issues you know and I thought I was doing a pretty good sales job on him and a fan walked up and had a five dollar bill in his hand he said uh, here said, uh, said I'm glad you knocked that SOB into the bank there <laughs> that gets five dollar bill and five dollars a lot of money back then <laughs> oh, that's a great story oh, I, I, I didn't mean to do that oh yeah I know you you owed him I know you meant to do that <laughs> <laughs> and turn around and walk off <laughs> <laughs> what the story was. Now, when you when you were interviewing the drivers, when you were on the other side, did you have any problems with any drivers? As you know, did you have a problem with Junior when you went up to talk to him as an interviewer? No. Nope. Really? No, nope, not really. Yeah. I, I did. Uh, we we became friends at the at the end of our driving careers and, and built respect for each. I think we always had respect for each other, and. Uh, I know I had a lot of respect for him as far as his driving ability and, and uh, as a man to beat. And, mm-hmm. But uh, I consider him one of the best friends I have in the world now. And uh, But even after I got into the radio and had the Ed Jarrett's World of Racing and carry that recorder around and do interviews, I never had any problems with any of them. Any of them, I'll be darned. It, it seems like the new drivers have, have I, I don't know what it is, but it just doesn't seem like they respect the the news press as much as they used to. Do you, do you kind of get that feeling, or? Yeah, sometimes I do, unfortunately. And uh, I think, generally speaking, that that they do. But there are a few on a few occasions that, uh, like last Saturday night. Mm-hmm. I I respect Kurt as a race driver. He's, he's a good race driver, no question about that. Uh, but uh, I I didn't necessarily agree with the, with the way that he. I I don't think anybody did, and and I didn't think, you you know, it's hard to get out of a car after you've been in it for four hours, you know, I understand that, but I I think these drivers got to learn, they got to respect these guys doing the media thing. Well, they do, and and I think most of them do, but also, I need to say this, that there are a lot more media people covering the sport today than there was back then, and the, uh, the, the media that who were covering the sport back then had respect for the drivers 
and didn't expect as much out of them as what the some of the media members do today. Sure. Uh, and I'm, I'm saying there's, there's, I think it's the, in the minority of those that that maybe uh, either their personality or the way they go about it uh, rub drivers wrong. Sure. Right. And uh, we didn't have uh, that because there were not that many of them. Right. Back in those days. So, you know, it's, I guess there are reasons for everything, but uh, but still, I, I, I think that that uh, that the media and, and other people who are doing work in the sport uh, uh, do deserve respect. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's there's a lot of times, like I know Tony. Tony does not hold back with the with the reporters when they come up and they keep asking him the same question over and over again, and he just basically gets fed up and and lets them know it. Yeah, it does, and and uh, I'm okay with that it, it, as long as he he doesn't try to physically. As long as it's <laughs> as long as it's done respectfully. I'm sorry. As long as it's done respectfully. Exactly. Yep. Yeah. Um, Take him behind the trailer and hit him with a helmet or something. <laughs> no. Uh, now uh, you retired. Re you retired pretty much in '07 from broadcasting. Do you ever get that hankering to get behind that microphone again? Not really. I, uh, and the reason is that I got tired of the travel and mm -hmm. fighting the crowds, and I, I hate to be. When I'm when I was doing it, and you know the the broadcast booths are always up at the top of the grandstand, and you had to go up through the grandstand, and, and so people knew that you were going to be coming up through there. And I well, here's the chance to get an autograph or get a picture or something like that. And that's okay, excepting that I had a job to do, and and, and I normally all my life I've I've never been a person to to get there early very often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Usually, I'm right on the baton or, or maybe a, a little bit late. And uh, so I'd be in a hurry, and then people would sign my cap. You can sign this one, but, you know, there's a couple hundred other people that want to sign, too. And so if you sign one, you feel obligated to do the others. And so I, I just, that when I say fighting the crowds, that's what I mean. It's not that I didn't want them to ask me. I'm flattered that they would ask me for an autograph, but the time, the timing of it. Mm -hmm. I hated to turn them down. And right. So, uh, I no, I don't have any, any desire. A couple of times that uh, that ESPN has asked me to come up in the booth, I did the nationwide race, a portion of one last year at Charlotte, and that was fun to do. They wanted me to up there with Dale, which was that was fun to do, be able to right with him and work. And then I was in there for a little bit at Indianapolis when they honored me there with the uh, car that. David Reagan ran. Right. Exactly. So, and, and that must have felt pretty good to... Oh, well, that was a real treat. No question about it. In fact, I just today received... Uh, uh, they, they put out a diecast of that car. Oh, wow. Cool. Just received a copy. <clears throat> I, I went down last week and signed 150 hoods that'll go on the cars when mm. they go on the market. Uh, wow. I don't know who those 150 go to, but anyway, I signed 150 of them for Lionel. Uh, but I know they'll be up for sale in the Hall of Fame, where wherever Lionel sells them. I, I don't know. Where the Lionel sells them. But yeah, that was a that was a real honor and a treat for, me, for them to do that for me and, and be there and be a part of it. And race goes up there and wins the pole. <laughs> and good. You know, and, and yeah, he ran very well up there. So up until uh, they took them white wheels off, and of course they told me beforehand that that's what they were going to do. And I told Jack Roush, I was at a Coca Cola down the week before last. And, so Jack, uh, I said, if you wouldn't take those white wheels off, you'd have had a stellar day there that day. Everything was good. He took those white wheels off. And he got a laugh out of that. <laughs> they don't run white wheels anymore. But. Now, it, we've had you on here for, we're, we're getting close to 45 minutes, and, and it's very appreciative. But um, somebody asked, um, what are you doing now? Are you, you're doing some stuff for Coca-Cola and UPS and, uh, you doing something with your son's racing venture? Yeah, we do. <clears throat> the Dale Jarrett Racing Adventure, which uh, everybody hears of the Richard Petty Driving Experience, which is a, a great organization. Uh, they're bigger than our organization is, but we uh, uh, we have uh, a 
very strong hold at Talladega. That's where most of our, mm-hmm. in fact, our cars are based there because of the fact that we we have more outings at Talladega than anywhere else. Mm-hmm. But we have have some, a couple of Charlotte each year and, and go to some other tracks too. With it. And I make some appearances. I made one in Charlotte week before last when we were down there doing uh, uh, doing an out a corporate outing. And so uh, then I do about five six appearances a year for Coca Cola. The Jarrett family was the first uh, member of the Coca-Cola racing family, and we were very proud of that. And so they kept me on, and they still use me a few times a year, uh, and, and I appreciate that association. And uh, then UPS, we still have an association with them. I'm, I'm not under contract with them like I am with Coca-Cola, but I still do some things, I mean, just like the uh, they sponsored this, this deal with Reagan. Uh, running my colors right at uh, Indianapolis to honor me there, and, uh, and and I make an appearance or so for them. Uh, as well. So that's uh, about. Uh, we still do a lot of local things community wise. We have the, the Ned Jarrett uh, American Cancer Society Ned Jarrett Golf Classic. We've been doing for 26 years now. We've raised over a million dollars. Wow! Cancer Society with that. Uh, it's coming up October 7th, uh, oh, right here at the Catawba Country Club, where I live. I'm, I'm right behind the number of green. Uh, you, you're a big golfer, too, aren't you? Well, I, I love to play golf. I love the challenge. I can play today. Uh, I haven't played as much this year as, as normal, but I enjoy the challenge. It's something that when I stopped driving, I started playing some golf because Dale and Glenn were were doing activities in school, and they both seem to like golf, so we just started playing mm-hmm. together, and then Martha, my wife, started playing too, so it's something the whole family <laughs> to do together for a long time. Now, we don't play together anymore. Uh, Martha and I might play together two or three times a year, and I might play two or three times a day a year with uh, Glenn and Dale, but uh-huh. it's, uh, not not very often, but, uh, but it is a game that we enjoy. Now does, now, does your grandson, Jason, does he get to go play golf with you guys too when he gets a chance? Every once in a while, yeah. yeah Jason, it, he's got himself so busy now that he doesn't have a lot of time to uh, to play. Mm-hmm. I only remember one time, that, and we played in a charity tournament, uh, a local charity tournament, and they put it was a humane society, and they put uh, Glenn, Dale, Jason, and myself. That's the only time the four of us have ever played golf together. We played with each other at different times. I probably played more with. I probably played more with Dale than I have with either one of the others, but Glenn would be awfully close. Uh, mm-hmm. He played several times. Uh, wow. Well, it, it's good that you at least can enjoy something other than the racing. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to get out there and just, just totally, totally away from that. They, there's a, uh, a Champions Tour event that's held at uh, another golf course, not the one that I live on, but here in the county at Rock Barn. And... Uh, I'm the honorary chairman of that uh, tournament, and so we we'll spend a lot of time uh, each year uh, with that. It's, uh, we, we donate a lot to charity from the tournament, and uh, it's just a wonderful event. And get all the big names, uh, uh, Fred Couples, uh, Dave Moss, and, uh, Fred Funk has become a very good friend of ours. And, uh, we name them, and they come. They, they used to play on the regular tours. Now they, they play on this Cool. I love to, to watch those guys. They they have me as one of the announcers off of the tee, and I enjoy that. Uh, so that ties up three days on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was talking with Jason the other day. I said the the fun thing I would like to eventually be able to do would be to get you, him, and Dale all on the show at the same time for a little family thing. Well, that'd be neat, but good luck. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. He's telling me about how hard it is to get Dale that, loose. Jason and I, we'd, we'd, be, we'd be easier to get things with, with his schedule. It'd be, it'd be tough to do. But I don't know, it might could happen sometime. And if it could happen, Jason would be the one that could probably make it happen. Right. Yeah, I tell you. Now, I remember uh, they used to have uh, some tapes, the VHS tapes they put out with the... Uh, Old time NASCAR stuff with with you guys, and you had like Childress and oh Junie Dunleavy, and y'all had like a big circle of people get together. 
Do you miss that? Yeah, I do. Yeah, but those were fun things to, to do. To, just to. Those were great stories. They were great stories. The, the, how many stories did we miss out of those four hours of tapes? I, not a lot, really. But, really? Yeah, but there's some stories that couldn't be told. <laughs> That's, true. That's, That's true. Those are the ones you can put on the Internet. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess it might be permissible today to tell some of it, but, uh, but uh, we wouldn't want to incriminate ourselves. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we would not. I am going to ask you about one driver, and we'll kind of make this, this the last thing, but I, I'm originally from Iowa, so I am going to ask you about Tiny Lund. Mm-hmm. Tiny was, uh, uh, he, he was, uh, first of all, he was a very good race driver. And uh, anyone who's ever seen a picture of him or seen him knows he was a big guy. Uh, but he, he had a heart as big as he was. He was, just, uh, he was fun to be around, uh, aggravating on the racetrack, uh, the most aggravating driver that uh, I ever raced against if you happened to come up to lap him. And uh, he'd race you harder than <laughs> uh, he would have for the lead. But I mean, that's just the way he did it. I mean, I wasn't, and it wasn't just me. I mean, it was anyone that he raced against. I mean, he, he just raced the wheels off of it. But, uh, but it was a lot of fun to be around. In, in fact, uh, Tiny had come to Hickory Speedway. He, he was one guy that I could get, uh, one of the big name guys that I could get to come to Hickory a couple of times a year. And uh, to try to, when I was running the track, to try to boost attendance. And he had, had come to Hickory to run in a special event on the Saturday night before he was killed at Talladega. So I've, I've always had a soft spot in my heart for him because the friendship that we had and, and, and the things that he did for me. Yeah, he, um, he actually, I, I think he had just come from Hickory and raced at Langley that next week before he got killed at Talladega and he was in a uh, Donnie Harris, one of Donnie Harris's car and Donnie lovingly tells a story about how they had to fit him into that car. Yeah, he was, he was tough to, as big as he was, it was, it was hard to find, just put him in any car because he had to have a little bit more room. Yeah. So. I thought you were going to, uh, I, the first person when you said Iowa, you were going to ask me that, I thought you were going to ask about Dick Hutcherson. Well, yeah, Dick and Ronnie were from Keokuk, Iowa, too, you know. And, yeah, and yeah he, they, they were. He, he was probably the toughest dirt track racer that I ran mm -hmm. in Dick Hutchins. Yep. But that's all he ever did before he came here. I, I don't think there was a, pay, at that time, I don't think there was a paved track in Iowa. Well, actually, there's only two paved tracks in the state of Iowa still. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. And, uh. And so, man, he knew how to do it. He was, he was tough. And yep. he became a very, very good friend. And, uh, in fact, I was flattered I went to his funeral and they asked me to get up and yeah. say a few words. So, uh, yeah, yeah he, he was he was one of the great guys to come out of out of Iowa. There was actually a lot that came out of the Midwest that, that actually tried to come down and run NASCAR. Oh, yeah. Don White. Yep. Sir, uh, man, there was a lot of drivers that came from there that were very, very good. Yep. So... Ned, I, I could sit here and we could do this for another hour if we wanted to, but I, we need to let you go. But I would love to get you back on here again, and maybe we can get you with Jason on here. Okay. That'd be great. Thank you so much for honoring us, and I, and I want to congratulate you again for, for being in the Hall of Fame. And well, thank you very much. I, I appreciate that. And for the fans uh, listening and watching, I, I, I want to to impress upon them if you get an opportunity whether you take a vacation or in the Charlotte, North Carolina area you need to go if you're interested in racing and NASCAR racing in particular you need to go to that Hall of Fame it is incredible isn't it it, it really is and, and as time goes by and more people are inducted uh, it'll, it'll get maybe better in fact you know, there will be more uh, displays but there's a lot of uh, displays there about people who are not in them have been not have been elected to the Hall of Fame. So uh, so you can see if you got a favorite in the sport that hadn't been elected yet, there's been only fifteen that have been elected up to this point. And so uh, 
there's plenty of other drivers and, and owners and other people who are represented in the Hall of Fame. And, you know, plan to spend a little time there because it's be well worth your time. It, it, it's big. I, I, I got to take my father down there last year, and we were thoroughly impressed with what they have going on down there. Yep. So. so. Ned, thank you very much. And, and talk to you folks. It's been a pleasure. Do what? It's been a pleasure. Enjoy chatting. Absolutely. We enjoyed Absolutely. it. And tell your wife hi and thank you for letting us have you on here. Sure thing. Okay. All right, Ned. Thanks a lot. Okay. All right, goodbye. Bye bye. I I knew we could go for another hour. Oh, and totally. He would have, totally. but <laughs> we're forty five minutes long on this interview, so it was great. Such hey, a great guy. You're talking about hour and fifteen minutes. He started at seven fifteen, eight fifteen. Yeah, hour and a half. And he he was not done. He was really he was not done. He would have no, kept Jason, right on going. Jason told me he said, "Hey, you get him on there." It'll be your job to get him off <coughs> there. We'll have him back on, and we'll continue this conversation. Absolutely. Like I said, it's a, I told Jason that I was going to try to see if I could do it, get all three of them on at the same time. And and, and I think that would be cool. And, and Ned's, he, the gentleman, I, that's exactly where it comes from, mm -hmm. right there, you know. And just a great guy. I love him. He's so. a great, he really is. Let's get out of here. <laughs> I'm tired now. <laughs> this has been an honor. So, thanks everybody for tuning in with us. Hold it. We got to run our stuff. Then you can think. Okay. How's that? Let's do a shortcut across the screen. What the heck? Oh goodness. Hi, my name is Natalie Sather. I drive the 94 K and N. Hey guys, I'm Daytona 500 winner Trevor Bain, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Racing. Hi, I'm Robert Richardson Jr., driver of the number 23 Dodge Challenger for R3 Motorsports in the NASCAR Nationwide Series, and you're watching Let's Talk Racing. Uh, I'm Timothy Peter, driver of the number 17 Toyota in the NASCAR Camp World Truck Series, and you're listening to Let's Talk Racing. <laughs> And once again, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out and watching Let's Talk Racing TV. And we will catch everybody next week. So have a good race weekend, and we'll see you later. See ya! Let's Talk Racing is brought to you by PC Doctors, Computer Sales and Services. This doctor still makes house calls. And also Hampton Incredible Tees and Signs, both located at 1248 North King Street in Hampton, Virginia.